This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory Glory to you, Lord Christ. Christ. This is Matthew chapter 5, beginning at the first verse. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is, the king, this is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. You have seen it a hundred times. You know, those National Geographic uh, films where there is, on the plains of the Serengeti, there is a a herd of antelope, and they're, they're standing there grazing quietly together, and then suddenly they spook. There's a lioness who's on the hunt, and she tries to sneak up on this herd, and suddenly they sense that she's there, and they take off, they run, and she, she uh, pursues them uh, as quickly as she can. They run as fast as they can, wherever it is that they can, and she pursues them. She relentlessly comes after them. And after a bit, after they've been running for a bit, uh, slowly uh, towards the back of the pack, there are some that that begin to be singled out. Uh, Maybe it's one who's particularly young, or maybe it's one that's wounded or sick. Uh, At the back of the pack, one that can't keep up any longer. And the lioness begins to focus her attention on that one. And inexorably, the distance between them closes closer and closer and closer until finally she catches it and dispatches her prey. And thankfully, the camera goes someplace else. It's a picture that we have in our minds about the character of this world. The fastest, the mightiest, the survival of the fittest, the quickest, red in tooth and claw, The kingdom of this world, uh, which is ruled by those who are powerful, fast, and cruel. And so then the question of, is that what life is like? And for many, uh, the answer is yes. The people during Jesus' time would have seen that in spades with the occupation of this powerful Roman army. The power of Rome and the ability for them to squash any dissent and the lack of compassion for any who were weak or broken. In fact, disdain for those. They saw it played out among their own religious and secular leaders within the House of Israel, people who were supposed to be people who were servants of the people, but who rather used and abused them for their own advantage. Might makes right the character of the kingdom of this world, and you've seen it over and over again and over again. Into such a world Jesus came. Jesus came and he taught a body of teaching. That body of teaching was the character of a different kind of kingdom. That it was possible to be able to live with different priorities and in a different way. He proclaimed that kingdom, he taught it, and he confronted those who were in leadership who did not submit to it. People thronged to this message of Jesus. They sensed an opportunity, a hope that life could be different. And so they went with him along the road that inevitably led towards Jerusalem. 
Jerusalem where Jesus ultimately confronted the leaders, the Romans, and the religious and political leaders of his day. And they arrested him. And they abused him publicly, shamed him, murdered him, and buried him in the ground. And then on that holy Saturday, quiet, just quiet, as people tried to wrap their arms around what happened, that this other message, this other kingdom seemed to be so vanquished, so powerless before the power of human pride and arrogance. And all of this preaching of Jesus was just a fantasy, a pipe dream. Might would continue to make right. But then on Easter Sunday morning, the earth quaked. The rocks shook. The tomb broke open. And this Jesus raised from the dead and forever vanquished the power of death and destruction and might and political power forever. And so people were, as they saw him, this resurrected Lord, I mean, the, as, as they would greet a friend that had been long lost, they embraced him. They were overjoyed to be able to see him, to be able to know that he was alive. But then it must have been gradually in these days of the Easter season after the resurrection that they began to scratch their heads and to realize the implications of the fact that Jesus had raised from the dead, that death was not the final word, and that this kingdom, the kingdom of this world, was not the ultimate kingdom. And so all of the teaching that Jesus had done about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, all of a sudden sprang to life as people began to say, there is another way. And that way is filled with a different kind of power, a different way of being able to live. And so all of a sudden now there was a preoccupation with, what was it that Jesus said? What was it that he talked about? We've got to go back. We've got to be able to understand again what was it, this kingdom that he was talking about so that we can fill it in, so that we can live it out in our families in our, and among our friends and in the communities and, and to be able to know how to deal with the people of this world in a different way. And so the teaching of Jesus began to, to take on tremendous new meaning. The Sermon on the Mount was one of those passages, one of those teachings, and it's the gospel lesson for this morning. So it's, it's in keeping with the 100 passages that we've been reading um, through the Essential Bibles Challenge. This, this beginning of the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus, uh, the, what's called the Beatitudes, the question of, of who is it in this world that's blessed? Is it the mighty? Is it the powerful? Who are the happy ones, the blessed ones in this world? And Jesus spells out those who are truly blessed, those who are truly rewarded. So what I'd like to do for us this morning is to, is to take the first three of those beatitudes. Uh, blessed are the uh, poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, and blessed are the meek. And to be able to just spell them out just a little bit, to look at them uh, with us, so that we have some sense of pressing into this counterintuitive world uh, that Jesus lays before us. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs in, is the kingdom of heaven. Who wants to be poor in spirit? Anyone? Volunteers? <laughs> we don't want to be, do we? We want to be rich in spirit, right? Filled with a sense of our own identity, our own pride, being able to identify our own agenda and to be able to go out and accomplish it, right? To be able to say, I am the center of my own universe. I live life on my own terms. I did it my way. Gosh, I've heard that someplace before. <laughs> and yet, 
as we do that, as the kingdom is based on our lives, on our priorities, on our sense of what's good and right, we cut ourselves off from a relationship with the one who has given us life and who has given us this world in which to live. And so we can live on our own terms if we like, but it is minuscule in terms of what is available to us in God's kingdom and in his righteousness, in all of the things that he has available to us. No, no, no. It is the poor in spirit, those who are empty, who recognize how vulnerable we are at the, in the face of all of the things that are coming against us, all of our enemies, all of the things that would threaten to destroy us, including death itself, to realize how powerless we are. We are powerless people. We are empty people to be able to meet the challenges of even our own lives. And we need someone who watches out for us, someone who protects us, someone who is looking out for our best interests. J.B. Phillips, the, the, uh, the famous um, translator of the New Testament, wrote uh, this, uh, translated this, um, this beatitude. He said, blessed are those who know their need of God. Blessed are those who know their need of God because they know how to cry out for help. They know how to look for meaning and value someplace else because we ourselves are bankrupt, as one of the collects in Lent says. We have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. But if we continue to remind ourselves, to tell ourselves that we are powerful and we are self-sufficient, we are doomed to the cell of our own selfishness. To be vulnerable, to be empty, to be in need, to embrace our neediness is the beginning of wisdom, is the beginning of an opportunity for a relationship, is the beginning of opening a door to have a relationship with this great God of ours. It is that step of emptiness and faith that allows us to enter into the kingdom of heaven, to surrender the kingdom of this world and the kingdoms that we make that, are, that aren't worthy of the name, and to, and to step into this great new kingdom, the kingdom of heaven and its new richness and its new priorities. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Talk about upside down. <laughs> Anybody want to be depressed? Grieved? Mourn? What does that mean? I mean, is it talking about people who have lost somebody who's died in their life? Well, certainly. I mean, that's a, that is, that's a reality in our life, the, the presence of death, and, and that we lose people um, who are important to us. But it seems like Jesus is talking about so much more. The opportunity for us to be able to look at this world, the world that is around us, as we, ex as we experience it, and as we see it, as you see it in the news every single day, and to be able to say, this world, is not the world that God intended for us. He did not intend for crazy people to have nuclear weapons. Amen? Amen? He did not intend for a world in which the poor and the broken would be, would be stomped into the dust. He did not intend a world in which we have to continue to fight for righteousness and justice and for healing and for, and for, and for just just kindness and compassion. He did not intend a world like that. And so it is just right for the, pe for the people of God to be able to look at the world as we live it and to be able to say, that is not right. And to mourn the brokenness of this world. And to push it a little further, to look at our own lives and the lives that we live and to be able to say, I'm not doing so hot either. I oftentimes am not the kind of compassionate, loving, justice-seeking person that I ought to be. And I mourn that. I mourn that. And to allow us then to be comforted. God knows it. He knows the world is broken. He knows we're broken. That's why Jesus came. He's not expecting us to be perfect. We wouldn't need him if we were perfect. He wants to wrap his arms of love around us, and all we have to do is to be able to admit 
that we are empty and that we aren't the way we're supposed to be. And then we can come into a relationship of his, with him so that he can embrace us and love us. We are oftentimes such silly people. We have preoccupations with this image of ourselves that is inflated, that is beyond all reality. We need to take ourselves lightly. G.K. Chesterton, the, the uh, Catholic writer, um, wrote, he said that angels fly because they take themselves lightly. <laughs> and the demons sink because of the law of gravity. When's the last time you laughed at yourself? That you had, you know, you thought that there was something so important or you had some image of yourself that you were really clinging to and then all of a sudden you just looked at it and said, you gotta be kidding. What was I thinking? You know, we need a lot more laughter in our lives, it seems to me. Um, sometimes it's a, it's a little humiliating, a little humbling. Um, there was, I was a priest back in Michigan uh, and my kids on a Saturday, beautiful Saturday morning, um, were out riding their bicycles. And I am their dad. And I decided that I had a thing or two to teach them about riding bicycles. And, uh, and so I had them stand off to the side and I got on one of their bicycles and I rode it to demonstrate how you do that. Well, they were uh, not terribly impressed. <laughs> and so, um, so I went around for another pass, but this time, um, I hung onto the handlebars and, uh, and I stood on the seat um, with one leg going down this road and looking at them to see how impressed now they were. What I didn't see was the pothole in the road ahead of me <laughs> and my bike hitting it and stopping and my body not stopping but continuing to go over the handlebars landing on my shoulder on the road. Um, now my kids were impressed, <laughs> and Darla, <laughs> as they stood around looking, wondering if I just killed myself or not. And so I spent the rest of the, the, rest of the day in the emergency room at the hospital where I had um, I'd sprained my shoulder. Fortunately, nothing was broken. And they put a, a sling on my arm, and it hurt. Um, so I had painkillers, and, uh, and then at some point in the afternoon, late afternoon, it occurred to me um, you know, I am a priest, and tomorrow is Sunday, and I was going to have to conduct services on Sunday, and I was going to have this sling on my arm, and all of these people were going to be asking me at the door, one by one, what happened? And so I was going to have to come up with a pretty polished story about how this, how this happened. But I realized that, um, that no matter how polished I ended up making it, and it wasn't gonna, it couldn't be very good. Um, my kids were going to be there to set the record straight and they would have taken great joy in doing that. And so, so on that Sunday, I stood up in front of the congregation at the announcement time to head off the questions at the door and just explained to the congregation what I had done. What a bitter pill, I will tell you, that this is <laughs> to have to swallow publicly as a priest. Um, but the laughter from the congregation and my own ability at one point, finally, to be able to look back and to say to myself, what an idiot you are. <laughs> <laughs> what a stupid thing you did and you got exactly what you deserved. The ability to be able to come to the place of laughing at ourselves, of taking ourselves lightly. You know, God expects us to screw up. It's okay. He loves us. He just wants to embrace us. And with the surrendering of those false ideas of ourselves, we come to a place where we can genuinely be comforted, where we can have a true estimate, a true, a true vision of who we really are and how great he is, how much he enjoys us, and how much the people who are around us love us and care for us. And then finally, um, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Oh, this upside down kingdom. You want to be meek? Anybody want to be meek? In our world, um, meek is kind of mousy, isn't it? I mean, it's kind of mousy. Um, it means you're a doormat for the people who are around you. Who wants to be a doormat? Uh, not many. 
So it's helpful to do a little bit of background check in, uh, in this passage and the way these words are used. The word meek uh, is the Greek word praus, which actually was a well-used word in ancient Greek and classical Greek. And it had to do with uh, something like humility, teachability, responsiveness. Uh, it had to do with, with knowing kind of your place and being able to respond to what needed to happen. So for instance, if there was a magnificent horse that had been well-trained and so the rider could get on that horse and could just with a touch of the rein could go one side or the other and the horse would know exactly which direction to go. Or with just a little bit of pressure from one leg or the other, the, res the horse would know exactly how it is to respond. The meekness that is here has to do with that teachability, that moldability of spirit that says, I will not just stand here and have it on my own terms, but I will allow myself to be shaped and formed by this great God of ours, by this Jesus of ours, who is showing us, showing us the meaning of life and telling us how it is that we can respond to the various stimuli and challenges that are around. It has nothing to do with being a doormat. In fact, it is only the meek in this sense that are able to have courage. It's all of a sudden the meek in this sense who are able to have a steel of spine and who are able to be courageous, who are able to ride into battle if it's need be. Because you know that the purposes for which you, you march are worth it. There is justice and there is righteousness. There is something worth standing for, except for your own sense of your self-ego. Jesus is talking about a different kind of a kingdom, a kingdom that is not of this world, a kingdom that is far more powerful than the kingdom of this world, but its priorities are absolutely upside down. They're very different than the kingdom in this world, and so we're invited to be able to step, while in this world, into his kingdom, the kingdom of heaven and to be able to use its resources, to be able to see the people around us in an entirely new way, and as we do it, to be rewarded by it, to accept all of the beauty and the joy that is a part of being a part of his kingdom, where fear has absolutely no place, and love rules. There's a wonderful um, little quote from a man by the name of Malcolm Muggeridge. He was a he was a famous um, um, pundit in England um, for the law. He, uh, Punch was, a, was kind of a, uh, a, a satirical um, magazine that he put out um, in England, always poking fun at the, at the, uh, the rulers and the, the authorities um, in England. Uh, he was a famous agnostic. And then at one point, kind of later in his life, he unexpectedly uh, went through a religious conversion. Uh, he ended up then going and, and studying with, um, with Mother Teresa, and the conversion just deepened in him, and he wrote a number of books about the Christian faith. And, uh, and, and this particular uh, couple of essays came towards the end of his life, as he was, it was kind of a retrospective on what was important and how it was that he uh, saw the values um, and his, his, his place in the world and in God's kingdom. And he writes this, he says, you know, it's a funny thing that when you're very old, as I am, 75 and near to dying, the queerest thing happens. You very often wake up about two or three in the morning and you are half in and half out of your body, a most <coughs> peculiar situation. You can see your, your battered old carcass there between the sheets and it's quite a toss up whether you resume full occupancy and go through another day or make off where you can see, like the lights in the sky as you're driving along, the lights of the city of God. In that sort of limbo, between being in and out of your body, you have the most extraordinary confidence, a sharpened awareness that this earth of ours, with all its inadequacies, is an, extraordinary, an extraordinarily beautiful place, that the experience of living in it is a wonderful, unique experience, that relationships with other human beings, human love, human procreation, work, all these things are marvelous and wonderful despite all that can be said about the difficulty of our circumstances. And finally, a conviction passing all belief that as a minute particle of God's creation, you are a participant in his purposes for his creation and that those purposes are loving and not malign 
are creative and not destructive, are universal and not particular. In that confidence is an incredible comfort and an incredible joy. Having experienced the kingdom of heaven, this world that Jesus sketches out, who would want anything else but to know that our poverty is his greatness. Our emptiness is his ability to use us, to reward us, to fill us with all kinds of good things that are beyond our measure. We are his resurrection people, living in this world, but not of this world, listening to a very different song as we march as his people, singing praise to him and living in his glory.